Hi everyone, it is so good to be here with you today as we continue our sermon series, Listen Up. I don't know about you, but this sermon series has been so good for my soul. It has been one of those messages where I have to stop constantly and really ask myself, like, what is God saying to me as a pastor, as a husband, as a son, as a friend, as a boss? What is all of this speaking into my life? And it has been my prayer that you have been able to do that. I know for many of us, we come to these seven passages in the book of Revelation and we think that they don't have anything to say to us. We think this was written a long time ago and that perhaps it was written for some time in the future. But in reality, God is speaking to us through these words. So I've been excited. I am excited for today. So wherever you are, I want to invite you to pause with me and let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much that You've given us your word. You've given us the promise that wherever we are gathered, you are here with us. And so my prayer now is we delve into the passage for today. It's simply that you would give us ears to hear. God, make clear to us what might be ambiguous. Make clear to us what might be confusing. God, we ask that you would speak to the depths of our soul today. So that when we're done with this passage that we would see more clearly. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So today, the title of my sermon is Don't Quiet Quit on Your Faith. Don't Quiet Quit on Your Faith. So let's get started in Revelation chapter 3, verse 1. And as always, John, the writer of the book of Revelation, begins each one of these messages to the churches with a description of Jesus. And every one of these descriptions matters to each of the churches that it's being written to. So to the church that was persecuted, Jesus says, I am there with you. I have power over death. To the church that was trying to be forced to be pagan and try other worship experiences with pagan and heresy, Jesus says, don't worry, I am the one true living God. I will be there with you. You don't have to worship them. And so today it is no different. And so Jesus begins this letter to the church in Sardis. And here's what Jesus says. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, the word of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. The words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. So, of course, as we remember, this is symbolic language. This is metaphorical language. Jesus is basically saying when he says the seven spirits or the seven stars, he is saying to the one, me, Jesus, the one who is giving this message to the seven churches. The number seven in scripture always is the number that is attributed to God. If we remember in Genesis, the Bible tells us that God creates the world in how many days? Seven. In seven days, God creates the world. And from Genesis to Revelation, whenever you see the number seven, it's the number of completion. It's the number of perfection. It's the number of God. So when Jesus says that this is the one who has the words of the one who has the seven spirits and the seven stars, what Jesus is basically saying is, listen, this is a message straight from God. This is a message straight from the Holy Spirit. You see, the last churches that we have been looking at, the last three churches, Jesus has had real serious problems with them. Today's is a little bit different. The way it's written is a little bit different. And so Jesus says, for you, church, to really hear what I'm going to speak into your life, it's going to be the work of the Holy Spirit. Will you be open to what the Spirit is speaking to you. Jesus says in John chapter 16, verse 13, He says, When the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all the truth. When the Spirit of truth comes, Jesus tells us in the Gospels that He was going to ascend back to the Father, but that needed to happen so that God could then send the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit as a person, as a thing, as an entity, as a whatever version of God that was. And Jesus says, when I go to heaven, it's okay. I know you're going to miss me, disciples. Followers of mine, I know it's going to be hard because it's always hard to say goodbye to someone we love. 
But Jesus says, I have to go so that the Father will send the Holy Spirit. And Jesus tells us that the reason that the Holy Spirit is sent is to guide you into all the truth. Jesus would say, there are many things I still have to teach you, but you can't handle it now. But when the Spirit of God comes, then you will know. And I think in many ways, that is the spiritual life. That is at the crux, at the center of your spiritual life, is are you willing to listen when the Spirit speaks to you? Will you be open to what the Spirit is saying? It's the question I've been asking you to ask yourself. God, what are you wanting me to hear as I read these words of Scripture? And then what are you wanting me to change? What do you want me to hear? How do you want me to apply it into my life? Will you be listening? Are you listening? Or are you like a petulant child who pretends to ignore what their parent is saying? You know, it's so interesting. There are some days that my three-year-old daughter will listen to everything my wife and I say. There are some days where we ask her to clean up, we ask her to eat her food, we ask her to do this, that, or the other thing, and she gladly does it. And then there are other days when our three-year-old daughter will simply not do what we're asking her to do. And I get a kick out of this. Yes, it's a little bit annoying at times when we're asking her to clean up her toys and she's not doing it and she makes excuses. Uh, Just last night, we said, okay, we need you to clean up your toys. It wasn't even that many. There was just a few things. And she says, oh, no, I don't feel good. And so we said, okay, go ahead and rest for five minutes. And then you'll feel better. And then you can clean your your toys. So we put a timer because we live by timers in our house. (laughs) And after the timer went off, we said, okay, it's time for you to clean up your toys. And she says, I can't. My toes are too tired. I don't know where she heard that. I don't think my wife or I have ever said that. But she kept making excuses. Now, I think sometimes as humans, we do this with God. We hear what he's saying. We just may not like what it means for our lives. We like living our lives a certain kind of way. We have a certain lifestyle that we like to maintain. There are certain social engagements we like to keep. There are certain things that we like to do as humans. And so even when God speaks into our lives, we're not always so quick to listen, especially when God is asking us to change something in our lives. It's easier for us to make excuses. It's It's easier for us to pretend like we didn't hear God. It's easier for us to say, well, I hear you, God. And I think what I'm hearing you say is that you want me to do that next year. And God's like, no, I'm being clear. I need you to do it today. And that's the crux. That's the that's the central aspect of our life of faith is, are we listening to what the spirit of God is saying? Because Jesus says, he he promised that the Holy Spirit, when Jesus goes back to heaven, the Holy Spirit would come, which means that the Holy Spirit has been around working through and within believers for more than 2,000 years. The Holy Spirit has been working in your life, whether it's been 19 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 60 years, 70 years, the Holy Spirit has been working. My fear is that for many of us, we haven't been listening. Because we've been listening to that audiobook that's just been really enthralling. Because we've been binge watching that show on Netflix. Because we've been putting off listening to God until the evening when we get home from work or before bed. And then bedtime comes and we're too tired. You know, I think for many of us, we've been putting off listening to what the Spirit of God is saying. But church, I am asking you today, will you have the courage to listen to what the Spirit of God is saying to you today? Will you have the courage to listen and then do what the Spirit of God asks you? That's what this whole series has been about, that God is interested in every aspect of your life. God wants you to flourish. God wants your faith to grow stronger. God wants you to live an abundant life today. But we haven't been listening. And so I want to continue in Revelation chapter 3, the second part of verse 1, Jesus says, I know your works. 
You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Jesus says, wake up. You have a reputation of being alive. In, in fact, he was saying, Sardis, you, there's not that many problems in your church. In fact, things are going pretty well. You have the right systems in place. You have the right staff in place. They didn't have a staff, but you have the right staff in place. You have the right services. You, you guys show up on a weekly basis or on a daily basis. Everything seems to be flowing really well, Sardis. It looks like you're alive, but he says, wake up because you have fallen asleep. And Jesus commands them, wake up and strengthen what little bit of faith you have left. Because here's what's happening. Sardis had put their faith on autopilot. Hey, everything is working. The system is working. We don't have to change, right? Don't fix what's not broken. So Sardis had put their church on autopilot and to society and to outsiders and probably even to the people on the inside. Everything was like, hey, everything's humming along. Everything is going well. Things are going great. But Jesus says it is in that moment of this routine of church, this routine of life. Wake up because if you think you're alive, but really you're dying. Sardis had put their faith on autopilot. Church, I don't know about you, but this is a this is a compelling message. I, I would even say this is a scary message even for myself. Have I put my faith on autopilot? Have you put your faith on autopilot? And I've told you this, and you know, I, say I get up early every morning, I get to the Word, I go to my office, I make my coffee, I start reading the Word, but even some days that feels like autopilot. And sometimes God says, look, I love it, I love that you're in the Word, I need you to go to this other part of Scripture, or I need you to pray a little bit longer, or I just need you to listen a little bit more. You know, I heard a speaker this last week say that before we pray, if you would just spend five minutes thinking about God, thinking about the one you're about to pray to for five minutes. And I know for some of you, five minutes, that's... We live in a world of TikTok videos and reels and shorts where we have about 15 or 30 seconds of attention span. And after that, we're on to the next one, on to the next one. But imagine how your spiritual life would change if before you started to pray, you just simply thought about the one you're going to pray to. If you begin to think about Jesus, how much your prayer life would change. I haven't practiced it yet. I just heard it the other day. But I'm curious. I'm excited to see how my prayer life will change if I focus on Jesus more than the things that I need to pray for. But we put our faith on autopilot. And we think that coming to church is enough, that dressing the right way for church, that giving our tithes and our offerings is enough. We get so accustomed to living our faith outwardly so that everyone can see that we are good Christians, good Seventh-day Adventists, and yet all the while internally, we've just put our faith on autopilot. Now, I'm not judging you. Most of our lives... Is on autopilot. Most of our days are the same, or, or if they're not the same, like your Mondays, you know, like for instance, every Thursday, I take my daughter to Baby Ninja's class, and I know that, and it's in my schedule. And if something else comes up, I tell people I cannot be there. And this just yesterday, we had a pastor's meeting with my immediate supervisors at the conference during the time that Baby Ninja's was happening, and I said, listen, I will be there 45 minutes late. But I am not going to tell my daughter that something else is more important than her. We have routines. Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, Fridays. We, we have these routines in our lives that for the most part we set on autopilot. And sure, things happen that are unexpected in our lives. That happens all the time. But for the most part, our life is on autopilot. Our fitness is on autopilot. Our diets are on autopilot. Our social media habits are on autopilot. Our faith is on autopilot. And 
And the more that we live our lives like that, the faster that our life is spiraling forward. And one day we're going to wake up and say, I wish I had done things differently, but you can't take time back. And here's how I know, at least for me, and I know if it's true for me, it's probably true for some of you because we're all human. We're all similar. I have this planner. It's called a full focus planner that I use almost every single day. And the purpose of this planner is for me to prepare. Really, it's to plan out the whole year. But then it's broken down into quarters like what are the things that I want to accomplish this quarter? And then on a weekly basis on Sunday evenings, I sit down and I plan my week. And what I have found that if I don't do that on Sundays, my Monday through Friday isn't as organized or intentional as I want it to be. In fact, this last week, I didn't do that. I, for whatever reason, I did not plan my week ahead. Maybe it was just a busy weekend. I didn't get to it. And now it's Friday was I'm filming this and I realize, man, this week was almost a wash. There was nothing that was, I did not set intention this week. My life just went on autopilot. And if that happens with our lives, it certainly happens with your faith. And I don't want you to set your faith on autopilot. I want you to be intentional about how you live your relationship with Jesus. Don't quiet quit on your faith. So recently, if you've looked at the headlines, if you looked at some of the news online, there's a new phrase that says that Gen Z, which I think, I don't know when they're born, but Gen Z has decided that they are going to start quiet quitting on their jobs. And it's not just a Gen Z thing. I think it's across the board for a lot of people. But here's what quiet quitting is. It says, we are just going to do enough at our, at our jobs for what we're getting paid for. And we're not going to put an ounce of effort more than that. I'm not going to take on those extra projects. I'm not going to take on those extra calls. I'm not going to take on those extra hours. No, listen, I am paid for 40 hours a week or 20 or whatever hours a week. And I'm going to put my time in and I'm going to clock out and then I'm going to go home. I think sometimes we do that with our faith. We do the minimum required, the minimum that we think is required of our faith. We show up to church. We you know, read our Bible. Maybe we give our tithes and our offerings, but we're just going through the motions. But really what we're doing is we're quiet quitting on our faith, on our relationship with Jesus. And then we wonder why we don't have a more vibrant faith. And then we wonder why we look at other people's lives that have this deep rooted faith that maybe they're going through some difficult things in their lives and yet they're still steady. But for us, we're a wreck. We're a basket case. And it's because if we're honest, we've quiet quitted on many things in our lives. See, the message for today, the message for the church in Sardis, and the message for you today in 2022 is, not put, is to not put your faith on autopilot. Don't do the minimum, but instead be intentional. Set intention about how you want to develop your spiritual life. And maybe that requires talking to myself, to Pastor Dave, to one of our elders. Maybe that requires, maybe that's you and you've been saying, man, I've been going to church my whole life. I've been doing all of the right things, but I still feel like I'm missing something. And if that's you, set up a time to talk with us. We can do it through Zoom or Google Meet or in person, but we want you to live a deeper life. I don't want you to live a secondhand faith. Secondhand faith is, is when you're just listening to sermons or listening to good Christian books or podcasts, all of those really good things. But it's secondhand from someone else's experience. I want you to get into the Word. I want you to wake up, listen up, stoke the fires of the faith that you still have, the, the dying embers of faith in your life. Stoke the fire. Get into the Word for yourself. Because Jesus promised that the Holy Spirit would lead you in truth. You don't need somebody else to teach you what Scripture is saying. I mean, I know sometimes there are, there are times when we need help. But if you spend time in the Word, the Spirit will reveal what you need to hear from that passage. Jesus says, stop playing. Stop playing at church. Stop pretending like you're this great Christian person. Forget all of that. Who cares what anybody else thinks? I just want an audience with you. Jesus says, wake up. 
work on the thing that remains, on the faith that still remains. I want that part of you because Jesus cares about your heart. So I want to I want to look at a story in Luke that I can't I can't preach this message from the book of Revelation if we don't look at Luke chapter 18 verse 9. Jesus has a parable to tell his disciples and you know Jesus always takes the opportunity to to go deeper. Jesus is not content to give clichés of faith. Jesus doesn't just give platitudes of faith and No, Jesus goes deeper. He wants you to have a deeper experience of faith. So Jesus tells a parable, tells a story, and here's what he says. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. So already Jesus is really laying out this story He says there was two men that go up to the temple to pray. One, a Pharisee. Now the word Pharisee is loaded with meaning. A Pharisee in Jesus' time was someone, as the Bible says here, who trusted in their own righteousness. A Pharisee was like the people in Sardis who their external life looked like they were really good religious people. Pharisees were religious people, but they were religious on a whole nother level. They were religious because they believed that they had to be good enough to earn God's salvation. They believed that they were literally the moral police. So they not only tried to externally live what looked like a good life of faith, so they would give their offerings and, you know, their commentators will tell us that the Pharisees would come up to the temple and they would lift their hand up as high as possible and they would drop their coins into the treasury, into the or their giving box in the first century so it would make as much noise so people would see and they would be like oh look at that pharisee he look at how generous he is he must be super holy and righteous they would wear certain kind of clothes they would speak in certain kind of ways right everything they were doing was so that people could see them and say wow they're really holy and religious and not only that, they were extremely legalistic, which meant that they believed that, the, that they had to act a certain way in order for them to receive God's grace. Jesus would actually go on often to say, like, listen, don't, let, don't, don't follow their example. <laughs> Jesus would say, don't follow the example of the religious people because they're going to lead you astray. And then the other man was a tax collector, and that's also loaded. In the first century, tax collectors were, um, at least where Jesus was speaking to us from, they were hated. Like, I mean, first of all, no one likes paying taxes, right? You look at the check, you look at how much we pay in taxes, and it hurts every single week. And back then, it was even worse because tax collectors would come to the the governor and say, listen, I will get you X amount of dollars. There was basically a bidding war. Tax collectors would bid and say, I can get you this much money and the highest bidder would win, and then they would go door to door and collect taxes, oftentimes collecting more than what the government was asking for, and whatever was left over, the tax collectors would keep. So they were wealthy. They were the wealthy of the first century. So Jesus is juxtapositioning these two people, a Pharisee, a religious man, and a tax collector. The Pharisee represented what was religious, the tax collector represented what was sinful and horrible in the first century. And Jesus continues in verse 11. The Pharisee standing by himself prayed, God, thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. The Pharisee lists out all of his accomplishments, all of the things that he does to show that he is a good religious person. And probably when he was fasting those two days, he was looking tired. He was looking hungry. We've all seen people like that. He was probably moping around so that people could ask, hey, Pharisee, what's wrong with you? And he could say, oh, I'm fine. I'm just, I'm fasting today. Oh, 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 you know, I'm fine. I'm giving, I'm giving all the tithes, all the 10% of all of my income I'm giving to the church. I, I like, you know what? I get 15%. <laughs> the 
So Jesus says that this Pharisee says, I do all these things, but thank God, thank God I'm not like these terrible people, these other bad extortioners, these people that are adulterous. Thank God, thank God I'm not like that tax collector. Like talk about comparing yourself. And then Jesus says, verse 13, but the tax collector standing far off would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Two men go up to the temple. One trusts in his own righteousness, one who tries to earn God's grace by being good enough, and the other, a sinner who says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Notice the difference. The tax collector isn't saying all of the good things he does. He doesn't talk about how even, yes, maybe he is collecting more, more taxes than should be, but maybe he is a, ph a philanthropist and he's giving more to other people or people. And he doesn't say anything. He doesn't say any of the good things that he has done. He simply acknowledges, God, I'm a sinner. And when he says, be merciful to me, what the tax collector is saying is, I know I'm a sinner. I know I have fallen short of the glory of God. I know the sins and the dark things that I have done in my life. I know all of those things that bring shame to me. God, I am guilty. So when you mete out your judgment on my life, all I ask is that you would be merciful. He was expecting retribution. He was expecting punishment and discipline. And he says, God, I deserve it, but please be merciful. The religious person doesn't even see the sin in his own life. The religious person doesn't even see his need for God. The re religious person doesn't even see how he too has fallen short of the glory of God, that he has sinned, that he is in need of salvation. He doesn't see that because all he can see is how great he is and how bad everyone else is. I don't have to tell you, but we have seen religious people like this in our lives. People that are constantly judging and criticizing. People that are judging you and criticizing you because you don't dress the right way. You don't go to the right church. You don't sing the right way. You don't dress the right way. You don't give the right way. You don't have all of the right programs at your church. People, we are used to having religious people judge us. And guess what? Jesus just shut them out. Jesus had no time for religious people in the first century because he was about his father's business. Jesus was about reconciling everyone like this tax collector who was willing to listen and wake up to be reconciled to a relationship with Jesus and the father. And this is what's happening in the church in Sardis. Jesus says, wake up. Listen, there is life that is waiting to be lived. There is life, but you've been asleep. You've been, you've been, you've been too drowsy on the medication of what you think is important in your life right now with what you think is important. You've been too drowsy by the routines of your life. And Jesus says, wake up. Wake up because there is life that is waiting to be lived if you would simply listen to what the Spirit is saying in your life. And you know what the Spirit has been saying in your life. You know what God has been asking you to stop doing. You know about the addiction that God says, listen, I will give you victory, but you have to be open to it. You know what God has been asking you, what conversation to have with your husband or your wife. You know what God has been asking you to do when it comes to giving of your time and of your resources. God has been shouting for you to wake up. But you've too, been too busy being drowsy by the things that you think are important in your life. And Jesus says, wake up. In verse 14, Jesus says, I tell you, this man, the tax collector, went down to his house justified rather than the other for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled but the one who humbles himself will be exalted jesus wants you to come humbly before the throne of grace jesus wants you to come humbly because jesus wants to wake you up in your life jesus wants to give you the life that he created you for quit quiet quitting on your life let me say it this way stop quiet quitting on your life stop living your faith secondhand by what the preacher says or what by that author says but instead spend time in the word don't be content with living your life of faith on autopilot but instead be intentional about setting that time daily 
with God. If you want true life change, it comes from sitting in the presence of Jesus. And so I just want to circle back to the last part of the letter to the church in Sardis. And really it's what we've been saying. Verse 3 tells us, Remember then what you have received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Yet you still have a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, that they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. For the one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Man, Jesus gives this promise. Basically, we've been, he, when he says to remember, and remember what you received and what you heard from the disciples when you received the gospel, he says, remember that, hold on to that. Waking up is recentering your life on the gospel, recentering your life on the fact that you were like the tax collector, a sinner dead in your sins. And yet even in that state, Jesus forgives you. Jesus makes you born again. Jesus wakes you up to the newness of life. And Jesus says, if you will simply come back to me, if you will simply be open to what the Spirit is saying, He promises three things. He goes, you will be clothed in white. Now, I don't have to tell you every part of the Scripture that tells us, but, but the Bible describes sin as scarlet, as red, as a stain. And Jesus comes and makes you white. White, the color of purity. You don't wipe away or wash away blood very easily, but Jesus says the sin in your life, I will wash away and I will clothe you in white. And then he says, and, and your name will never be taken out of the book of life. The book of life, that metaphorical book of those who have been saved. The seal of salvation is your faith. You are saved by grace. Jesus gives this assurance. He says, if you would simply wake up and come to me, I will never blot your name out of the book of life. And I know that's a lesson that we don't hear. Because for many of us, we're still trying to earn our salvation. We're still trying to be like that Pharisee, trying to be good enough, trying to show externally to other people that we are good Christians, that we truly are saved. But God doesn't care about that because God is after your heart. He isn't checking your performance stats. It's not like baseball where every single thing you do is another stat in a column of your life as a baseball player. But instead, Jesus is a, is a God who lives by faith and he's not checking your stats. He's simply checking your heart. Jesus is simply after your heart. So you don't have to earn your way into the book of life. It is earned for you at the cross. Yeah, even you. Even those things that you have done in your life that you wish no one would ever find out. Even those dark moments when you feel stained like you can never live past that thing where God could never forgive you for that thing. Even you, Jesus promises to clothe you in white. Even for you, Jesus promises to never blot your name out of the book of life. And it says and he will confess your name to the Father and the angels. You will be known in heaven. All you have to do is wake up. Wake up to the voice of the Spirit. Hear what God is, is saying to you and then act on it. Because Jesus cares about your heart and what he cares is about relationship with you. And that's the message for the church in Sardis and it's the message for you today. God loves you and desires an eternal relationship with you. But you have to wake up. Turn to Christ so that you will live the life that Jesus created you for. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, wake us up. We want to wake up. We don't want to be alive and yet be asleep. God, wake us up today. Help us to hear your spirit convict our hearts of what you are saying to us today. Give us the courage and the ability to keep doing what you're asking us to do. God, help us. 
Help us to live in this eternal relationship with you today so that we would not miss out on your life-giving presence. I pray all this in the loving name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you for tuning in and joining us today. If this was a blessing to you, I want to invite you to partner with us and be a space creator. There are three ways that you can partner with us. The first one is to share this message with your friends, with your family, with your coworkers, on your social media. Let's spread the good news of Jesus together. The second way that you can partner with us is by praying for us. We can use all the prayer we can get because we know that God is doing something wonderful here at the Bolingbrook Church. The third way that you can partner with us is by giving of your time and of your resources. There is a link in the description box below. You can go ahead and give through that link. We want to thank you for being a space creator. God bless you.